thank you so much for joining us at our reporting on coronavirus webinar series. First Draft's mission is to empower societies with accurate information in critical moments. We help reporters around the world to produce credible coverage. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our U.S. Director, Claire Wardle. Claire, welcome. Thanks, Nell. Uh, thanks for uh, letting everybody into this webinar. I love the process of people saying hello in the chat and to see that somebody's from Nigeria and an old friend from London and an old friend of Chris's from Tennessee. So thank you for coming to this webinar. Uh, as I suggested on Twitter, um, I'm not always as good as I should be around these things. And I think many people who work in journalism, we go to these kind of trainings and people tell us to do things and then we feel bad about ourselves and then we don't do them. However, I'm hoping that Chris is going to convince me to spend all weekend becoming a much better person because the kind of work that we do is more important than ever. So my name is Claire Wardland, the US Director of First Draft, and I'm joined by Chris Dufour, who I met at a journalism conference about two years ago. And he came up and said, hey, you know, I use First Draft training materials in, in my teaching and I really like the things that you do. But here are some other things that I think I would like to talk to you about. And it became quite clear that he knew a ton of stuff and he was particularly good around security. And so when we were thinking about webinar topics, we thought, let's get back in contact with Chris and see if he would be willing to run a webinar for us to scare us into doing all the things that we should do. So Chris is an independent consultant who very kindly said that he would run this webinar for us. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate y'all having me today. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is gonna be a lot of fun. Folks, um, uh, I don't want anyone to feel like, uh, like this is painful or that you're doing things wrong online ever uh, because it's really, really hard today to get security and privacy right personally. And then when you add your family to it, when you add your work to it, when you add your school to it, when you add so many other things, the digital data landscape is moving so quickly all the time that the best that we can do is share best practices. And that's really kind of what I'm here to do today is to share some of my best practices, uh, give you guys some resources to take home with you uh, so that you can begin to get a little bit more conscious of all of the data that you're, you're leaking out there, either intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, and and kind of like Claire said, um, uh, these, these things are, 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 are potentially scary to begin with, but the more that you get involved, uh, with your own security and you look at some of the places that you've logged into, whether intentionally or unintentionally, and realize uh, uh, what your fit footprint looks like after some time, um, you'll, start to, you'll start to realize that this is actually a habit and you're, you're, you're really getting into an area where you, you can build better habits. And the, be and, and the great thing about habits is, is that the more that you do it, the better you get at it, the quicker it is, and the less scary it is over time. So we got three goals today. We're gonna understand our digital footprint. We're gonna talk a little bit about how to do that and, and ways to think about your digital footprint. Uh, I'm gonna spend a lot of time showing you how to harden internet browsers for maximum security, specifically the Firefox browser. Uh, and then finally share some other best practices for enhancing your personal security. So uh, I hope these three things will, uh, uh, will not be too scary. And we'll begin by thinking about that digital footprint, right? So um, how many places have you, have you logged into? Do you even know? Have you even thought about all the places that you have intentionally and unintentionally put personal information, work information, school information, uh, just yourself, and then think about how many other places have pulled information about you because you've clicked yes to accepting terms and conditions for a particular service that you use. Um, how many places have you signed up for loyalty programs so that you could score a discount on a hotel or an airline? Um, we're living in an unprecedented time where the sharing of personal information and data has moved so quickly that it is really, really difficult for us to wrap our minds around all of the places that we've leaked information online. So your internet habits, every time that you touch the internet from a desktop computer, from a mobile device, everything that you're doing, everything that you, you press yes to and forget to clean up on the, on the backside potentia, uh, potentially puts you at risk for some type of bad behavior. So uh, the first step of course is figuring out what your digital footprint looks like. Uh, your data can be a target, particularly if you're if you're a journalist right now. Um, this is a, uh, this is from a, a, an investigative journalist that I admire quite a bit by the name of Brian Krebs. 
He wrote a fantastic book called Spam Nation, investigating uh, the sources of uh, of Russian cyber criminal uh, spam networks. And a lot of bad things happen to Mr. Krebs that he writes about in his book um, related to the, the leaking of his personal information and identity. Um, this particular graphic that he produced on his blog shows all of the potential outcomes and risks of letting your data become a target. Uh, it only takes one time for somebody to get access to your social media account and potentially add that account to a botnet uh, where suddenly you're amplifying false messages, misinformation, disinformation on behalf of another actor, and you don't even know about it. Um, let's say that you do know about it. Let's say that you have a really great information security professional working in your organization, and they come back and say, hey, uh, your account's been compromised, uh, change the password. Well, as soon as it happens once, you only need a few seconds to get that, that message that's out there. Um, that's, and, and that could potentially be credibility damaging for your organization. Kind of stinks, but it happens. Um, so there's lots and lots of, of outcomes that we think about uh, that we also that we can't think about yet because we're just not focused on, on those types of things. So the best option that we've got is to understand all of the data that we've got that, that's out there and try and police it up as much as possible. Um, I kind of I say that if we revisit the basics as much as possible, then, then we're gonna be in a, a better place than we are if we, if we don't. Um, Burt McCline Center at Harvard actually just put out this great resource about building and protecting your online presence. It's aimed at high school aged kids. So folks that are just getting online uh, or have been online for a few years since you know technically they turned 13 or whatever uh, and are beginning to think about like who they are online, uh, what their, their 10 Instagram accounts or their Snapchat account looks like. Uh, this is a this is a great resource for not just educators, but parents and individuals. I went through uh, each one of these little steps and I've got a worksheet here about understanding how to set the privacy settings on uh, a number of different accounts, but also what the different accounts say about my online identity. Uh, I'm not the same person on LinkedIn that I am on Facebook, and that's because I'm very careful about who I connect with on Facebook. It's generally just for family and friends. Um, LinkedIn, on the other hand, wide open. I want to connect with everybody on LinkedIn. Uh, and, partial, but, and part of that is, is professional based and part of it also is search based. The more connections that you have on LinkedIn, uh, uh, the better search results you get sometimes. So uh, I have a different or controllable identity on a variety of different networks. And I'd recommend you thinking through that digital footprint for yourself and use this resource to do that. Um, start by sketching your digital identity. This is a really easy exercise that you can do anytime that you want to. All you need is a piece of paper or a whiteboard. Start by writing down your email and your phone numbers, even ones that you don't use anymore. Uh, I kind of I go back to the email phone number thing because this is typically what most accounts need to establish your identity someplace. You can always give a fake name or something like that, but usually to log into something you need an email address and or a phone number. Uh, write as many of those things down as you can. And then for the second step, for each one, write down any connected apps, social media services, newsletters, loyalty programs, anything that you could have used those, those email addresses and phone numbers to sign up for or gain access to. Once you've kind of finished brainstorming that, you can then log into each source and perform a security audit. What I mean by that is restrict settings, delete old data, enable two-factor authentication, change the password, or delete the account entirely. Uh, Google in particular has a great self-service center for privacy checkup that I'd highly recommend you use. If you use Google services at all, Gmail, uh, uh, any of the cloud services, they have a great system to go through and, and, and ask yourself, do I really even need all this data associated with my Google account anymore? So, so think about that. Fourth, rewrite your digital identity using that Bertman Klein uh, resource. They have a My Online Identity worksheet attached to that website uh, and associated exercises as a guide. What do you want each piece of your digital identity to look like? As a journalist, we kind of have a responsibility to have a public facing profile sometimes. We need to be associated with our journalism organization. Uh, we also need the public to trust us in some way and folks to reach out to us in a public way. Uh, so what does your public facing identity look like? What is that, that identity that you want to interact with the public? Is it just on a particular network like Twitter? Uh, do you want to restrict Facebook from, from being public? Uh, one of the ways that you can rewrite that identity is thinking about different ways to represent your name. Uh, maybe you don't necessarily 
want to use your full name on Twitter. Maybe you want to use a handle of some kind. That's also helpful when breaches happen in, 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 uh, in the future uh, because that way you can see like, oh, well, somebody's trying to use particular data from LinkedIn. And I know that because I use a very specific way of spelling my name on LinkedIn, uh, whether just initials or something like that. So think about ways to, to rewrite your identity where it's helpful for you in all of the different ways that you want to represent yourself online. And then finally, we're going to employ additional identity security techniques to further secure yourself. That's what we're going to do next. Um, so that's a, that's a good place to stop actually before we move on to browser hardening. Uh, Claire, do you have any questions or is any, any questions floating up that y'all want to talk about real quick? Yeah, well, there's a question about uh, the best password managers, but I suspect you are going to have a section on password managers. Absolutely. We're going to talk specifically about password management here pretty soon um, because that is a, that is definitely a great way uh, uh, to begin to vary some of your habits. So that's coming up, I promise. Okay, so I have a question, which is imagine that you'd really started getting into this world, sort of, you know, 2007, and you hadn't had any security training with Chris before. So you were really lazy and potentially had the same username for lots of things. And other. so when I'm doing my audit that you've just described, how much could I or anybody else take, you know, make up for really bad practices over 10 years? Like uh, if we change now, like how, how much damage has been done over 10 years? So that's a, that's a really good question. I, I, I have a resource at the very end of this presentation I'm going to give you to help clean up some of our digital baggage. Um, uh, it's from a company called Abeen. Uh, the, the resource is called Delete Me, and it's a service that actually goes out and looks for specific targeted personal information that you want to clean up from the web. Uh, so I'll show you what that looks like a little bit later on. Uh, but but the, the best practice is really to think, to think in these terms. Um, you've leaked information online. I use the word leaked, but, but you've only done it because you want something to be more convenient. Uh, so as you're interacting with things online, as you're trying to buy something or you're trying to log into something, ask yourself, is this more or less convenient? If it's less convenient, it's usually more secure. Uh, if it's more, if it's more convenient then usually someone is using is, is, is making it more convenient to, to, to pull information out of you. Yeah. I wish I didn't love convenience as much as I do, Chris. Anyway, <laughs> onwards. Yeah. And, and we all do. And then, and that's the, and that's, that's why we call them best practices is, is we can only recommend best practices, but we also know that we're all human and we do need a little bit of convenience in your life. I am the exact same way. I'll share with you a really quick story. Uh, I was a, a power user of Foursquare. Uh, when it was uh, when it first came out, and man, I, I checked into everything. I, I, I there were pictures, there were reviews, there were everything you could possibly think of. Flash forward ten years, uh, the data is still out there, and you can't actually delete it. Uh, they have a process on the Foursquare website to go in and delete your old Foursquare account, uh, but it's broken uh, and it doesn't work very well. And um, uh, it, it's one of those services where you actually, are, I'm getting close to thinking that you may have to have a lawyer involved uh, to get some of that information deleted. Uh, so uh, I'm- That is I'm a great story. It makes me feel a lot better. Yeah, I'm just as guilty of it as anybody. And I think, I think everybody should think about this as therapy, right? As, as part of this is just understanding that this is just the way that, that the internet as it's grown has come to be. It's about the, the transfer and trading of humans personal information um so we're all we're all just trying to get our arms around it to some degree all right let's move on to browser hardening so most of breaches problems uh any any types of leaks of information usually starts with a browser habit a bad browser habit of some kind uh, i'm going to focus mostly on firefox for this section this session uh, but I do want to acknowledge that there's tons of browsers out there. Everybody's got different preferences on what internet browsers to use. Um, I will tell you the only one that I will specifically say don't use is Internet Explorer. Uh, if you are on a, a Windows or a PC system, uh, hopefully you have upgraded to the free Windows 10 uh, operating system at this point, which should come with a Microsoft Edge browser. Uh, which is a lot more secure. Internet Explorer is not supported by Microsoft anymore. So if you're, if you're using it, you should instantly assume that it's Swiss cheese and someone is putting malware on your machine. Uh, uh, I would highly recommend uh, uh, getting that off your machine as, as quickly as possible. Uh, Microsoft has made a ton of great improvements to their Windows system. Uh, and I'll talk specifically about one of them, their antivirus software in the future. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot of experience with Microsoft Edge as a browser yet as compared to other ones. 
Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm going to focus mostly on Firefox. You have more control over your personal privacy and security using a properly configured Firefox browser than you do any other browser uh, on the market right now. Um, so that being said, I'm actually going to switch out of the presentation and uh, let's see here if I can figure out what we're going to do now is we're going to switch over to an actual Firefox browser. Um, so this is Firefox. I'm actually out of sight right now. If you want to go and check this out, this is one of my recommendations uh, for you uh, is the privacytools.io website. Uh, but specifically privacytools.io forward slash browsers. Uh, privacytools.io, a collection of security researchers and experts who have kind of gotten together and tried to break as much as possible uh, uh, different browsing experiences. And they have some recommendations uh, for what browsing habits and tools to use. And in this case, uh, they have desktop recommendations and they have Android recommendations and they have mobile device recommendations. I'm gonna focus primarily on Firefox for desktop right now um, with everyone sort of uh, a caveat understanding that you can apply any of the things that we're talking about to any browser that you use. Uh, one of the first things that I like to tell everybody to do when you're hardening your browser is go up to your hamburger menu and let's move that. Uh, go up to your hamburger menu and go into the preferences options. And it should bring up a screen that looks a little bit like this. This is the screen that nobody looks at. This is the, the screen that, uh, that takes you to the settings for your browser. Um, hardening your browser is simply, the, is, is simply the processes that we're about to go through, which is making it really, really difficult for other people to kind of penetrate. And one of, the, one of those things is turning off things that make life more convenient, unfortunately. So um, starting at the general, there's not a whole lot that you need to, uh, you need to check or uncheck as you go through. One thing I tell everybody to think about is uh, under language, uh, there's an option here to check your spelling as you type. And I use this as an opportunity to talk about how spelling is checked. Uh, is it a dictionary or a service that's built into the browser? Or is it actually something that the browser is calling out to? We don't always know the answer to that. So if I check this, yeah, my browser is gonna check my spelling as I type, but I don't know who's seeing that. I don't know what algorithm is reading that. Is it proprietary to Firefox and the organization that created it, Mozilla? I don't know. I could probably go look it up, um, but I don't know, so I'm gonna leave it unchecked, and I'm just gonna risk the fact that I'm gonna forget an apostrophe in the way that I spell your from time to time. Um, if you do check and you are comfortable with it, you can leave it checked, that's cool. Uh, I want to move from that, though, over to the privacy. And actually, before that, let's do the search tab real quick and talk about search and search engines. Not all search engines are created equal. Um, almost all the search engines that are out there, they exist for free because they're logging your search habits. They want to understand what keywords that you're using so that they can serve relevant ads or sell that behavior someplace. Um, Every one of them does it, even the ones that claim not to. So uh, as you can see, my default, I'm using DuckDuckGo. The reason I use DuckDuckGo is because it builds itself as a privacy-focused search engine. It claims not to, to uh, uh, log data about searches and then do anything with it. Um, okay, uh, I believe it to the extent that it is competing at a very small level with other search engine companies that are out there right now, and certainly not to the degree that a, that a Google or a Bing would. Um, it's good enough for right now. So I use, I use DuckDuckGo personally, but again, I'm not recommending one search engine over the other. I think everyone should use what they think is, is, is great and have that baked into your, into your browser. One thing that I will tell you though is, is search suggestions. So search suggestions is the thing is when you're popping into your browser, like I think I want to know, you know French military victories uh, and all of a sudden it changes it to French military defeats because it thinks that's what you really mean. Uh, in fact, that's happening because you've decided to check this box right here under search suggestions, providing search suggestions. What's happening is, is that as you type in the browser, the browser is calling back to a database in an algorithm someplace saying, this user is beginning to search for French and then military. Oh, it, before you even get to the word victories, it's suggesting defeats because that database and that algorithm thinks that's what you're searching for. Um, what you should do is not have that checked because what, what you're allowing to have happen if you have it checked is your browser to communicate to an 
unknown service, an unknown database, or an unknown algorithm that is providing that, that, uh, that information. It's happening in microseconds. We don't even process it happening. It just, it just kind of happens because you're typing very fast. Um, it is a risk because you're allowing the browser to talk outside of whatever it is you happen to be doing. Uh, I, I typically use that, uh, leave that unchecked. You are more than happy to check it if you want to. You can show search suggestions in private windows, however you want to do it. Personally, I don't. Um, that's all I want to talk about with search engines right now as, as part of your browsers. I'm going to move over to the privacy and security tab right now. Now, privacy and security in Firefox is awesome. A lot of this is pre-configured. Whenever you're running in a private mode, uh, this, uh, this is, is perfectly configurable. Um, one of the things that Firefox is well known for is its ability to block third-party co cookies, trackers, and ads. So you can just go in here and use the off-the-shelf stuff and say, I want standard protection and performance, and these are all of the things that, that uh, uh, the Firefox browser is built to block right off the bat, right? Social media trackers, cross-site tracking cookies, crypto miners, fingerprinters, and you can go from standard protection to strict protection. Um, now, the only thing if, within the Firefox browser that says the difference between standard and strict is really it will just break websites. And I'm going to show you what that means here in just a second. Um, however, I like to go to custom. Uh, I always go to custom because I always run a private session uh, or, or private browsing session with, with Firefox. And, and as a result, um, I have the option of, of turning some of these on specifically or off. Uh, as a default, I tend to block all third-party cookies. If I block all cookies all the time, it usually means that the website's not going to work. So if I'm trying to use Firefox to log into, into Facebook and I have all cookies blocked, it, it won't let me. It literally won't even give me a login screen because that's one of the things that the Facebook cookie, when it deposits onto your browser, is looking for is, will it even allow me to, to deposit this particular cookie on, on the browser? Uh, I also block all tracking content in all windows at all time, even though I'm usually in a private window. Uh, so that's just sort of a recommended way to harden the browser as best as possible. If you're somebody that engages in crypto mining, um, you're going to need to turn this off here. Uh, uh, right, wrong, or indifferent, no, no opinions about that one way or the other. Uh, and then fingerprinters. Fingerprinters are, uh, are, are systems that actually look at what types of information being released by your browser and fingerprinting. It creates a very unique fingerprint of your browsing experience. Uh, one way to look at that is if you pop open another, another browser tab here, I'm going to go to a site called ipleak.net. Now, ipleak.net is literally just a website that is trying to fingerprint all of the discoverable information about your browsing session in your computer. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, the first thing that it's looking for is your IP address. Uh, and it will determine the IP address specifically and resolve it back as close as it can to a city. In this case, there's a New York, uh, it's a New York IP. And the reason why that's happening is because I'm running a, a VPN right now. I'm actually in Texas. Um, but I'm running this, this, uh, this VPN, so it should actually detect my IP address. Some of the other, other stuff uh, that it's looking for is a WebRTC detection. Uh, WebRTC is a very specific communication protocol that sometimes works outside the protection of a VPN. Now, this is really, really important uh, because some of you are doing research on Discord or other apps that specifically use the WebRTC protocol. Um, Firefox is the only browser that gives you the technical ability to block WebRTC leaks. Uh, if you click back over to your privacy tools, you'll notice here with the Firefox thing, there is a link that says WebRTC. If you pop that, there is a nice little menu of things that you should do to configure your browser to prevent WebRTC leaks. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not highly technical. Uh, it may seem that way because the menu that you bring up actually looks like a whole bunch of code stuff. Uh, but if you follow these steps, one, two, three, four, five, um, and then all of these additional ones here, one, two, three, four, uh, ensuring that each one of these things looks like this, WebRTC will be disabled in your Firefox browser. Problem, if you're looking at Discord, and that's part of what you do for your job, 
you're going to break the website and you won't be able to use it. Um, just, uh, the, just truth in advertising about that. Now, Firefox, again, is the only, is the only browser that will allow you to do this 100%, disable the WebRTC, uh, the WebRTC tracking. I'll show you, and there's an extension for Google Chrome uh, that's actually called the WebRTC limiter, and you can add that to the Chrome, uh, the Chrome browser, and it will limit as many of those WebRTC requests as possible, uh, but it's not 100%. So, uh, we were talking about fingerprinting. Some of the other things that uh, uh, that IP Leak is looking at are things like your DNS address. So one of the things that I always look for on this site when I'm checking my uh, my connections in the morning is does the IP address that's detectable up here match the DNS address down here? Uh, if it doesn't, that means that something on my machine is leaking my DNS address. DNS being the local address from how I'm connecting to my internet service provider or ISP. I have almost zero control over how the ISP reports my address, uh, but I do have control to be able to use a VPN and secure everything within my own little operating bubble right here. And one way to determine if that's leaking or if I've got malware or something on my, sh my machine that's reporting it out is by comparing these two addresses and making sure that they are the same. If they are the same, that means your VPN is working properly and that's good. Uh, there's a bunch of other information down here I won't go through, but IP Leak is a really good website to kind of make sure that your security setup is, is working well. And that's what we call a finger printer. Uh, going back to hardening our Firefox browser, uh, some of the options that we have in our privacy and security uh, uh, options here, send websites that do not track signal that you don't want to be tracked. Uh, I always want to do that only when Firefox is set to block known trackers. If you're always sending out information to a website uh, that says do not track, do not track is a, is, is a protocol that depending on the security researcher that you ask either works or it doesn't work. Um, websites also have to agree to say, okay, I won't track you and many of them don't. Um, so it's not especially as helpful as, uh, as, as, as it could be. And what's more, if you're sending the do not track protocol, it also tells a potential nefarious actor a little bit about your activity. It means that you do care about your security. It means that you do ascribe to the fact that the do not track protocol is, is worthwhile. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I choose only when Firefox is set to block known trackers. In your cookies and your site data, uh, if you have set your Firefox browser to primarily operate in a private window, this will automatically, this will automatically uh, configure itself to uh, dump all of your cookies and, and everything, your site data and history, browsing history, everything, every time that you close out. Uh, but you can also clear and manage your data manually in here. Uh, everything you've got options when you hit clear of the things that you want to get rid of, cookies and site data or cached web content. Cached web content is stuff like a photo. Um, let's say you've been doing a bunch of reverse image searching and you got a tons of, of URLs for photos that you've been uploading to Jeffrey's Exit Viewer or whatever. Um, cached web content is supposedly supposed to make your browsing experience faster if, if you allow that stuff to relate to stay in your cache. You're only saving a couple of nanoseconds. So, you know, is it really worth it to, uh, to leave all that stuff on your machine, particularly if a photo has a pixel or two in there that might contain a callback to uh, a server that has some malware that's going to download to your machine? I don't know. It's up to you to make that decision, but uh, I, I typically don't keep anything in my browser after the session that I've entered. Uh, you can also manage the data pretty specifically. Once you actually have uh, cookies and uh, browsing caches and content and stuff like that, it will list every website and domain uh, for everything that's in the cache, and you can choose to do specific things with them here if you want to. And I'll show you another way to do that with, a, uh, with a, uh, uh, an extension here in a minute. I always keep this guy checked, delete cookies and site data when Firefox is closed, every time, uh, even when I'm not in private browsing. Logins and passwords. Uh, first thing that I'll tell you, never have a browser save your logins or passwords. Um, that's, that's a never. Uh, one thing that I'm beginning to be uh, convinced of is that as Mozilla, uh, which is a privacy focused nonprofit entity uh, in the organization behind the creation of the Firefox browser, uh, they're working on a secure password uh, saving protocol, um, but they're building it into a browser. 
Uh, one of the reasons for using a password manager and not necessarily having your browser remember everything is that you're using two different trusted services to create defense in depth. So if somebody gets access to your browser, there is the risk that somebody could also get access to any saved passwords that you have in the browser. They might not be able to get access to your password manager though. So by using two different protocols, two different uh, uh, security encryption keys, uh, it creates a different layer of security. I'm ambivalent about whether or not Firefox and Mozilla have got a great password remembering service that's secure at this point. I think uh, more testing is needed by independent security researchers that are out there. Um, but that could change in the near future. So uh, somebody asked earlier, what, what's the best password manager that's out there? Uh, there are a lot. Uh, I'd say that, uh, that as soon as you choose one, you're probably going to hear in a couple of weeks that it's been breached, uh, as was the case with the last pass a couple of years ago. Um, last pass, pretty good. One password, pretty good. Uh, I also hear key pass is pretty good. Uh, and one of the reasons we like each, each one of those is that they automatically generate passwords for the websites that you go to so that you're not having to be stuck remembering things. They're creating these super complicated hashed passwords for each one of the websites. And in some cases, uh, as they determine that websites have been hacked or that there's data breaches, they will force password resets automatically within the system. So those three are usually pretty good, but I'd, I'd, I'm going to give you some more resources at the end of the presentation to, uh, to help kind of figure out third party options for that. Uh, history, never remember your history. Always make sure that you're dumping that at the end of your uh, uh, at, at the end of your browsing sessions. And then you have lots and lots of permissions, location, camera, microphone. I always make sure that location can never ever be determined from my browser. Uh, you're always going to go down here and make sure that block new requests asking to access your location. I don't even want them to ask me. I'm just automatically blocking them all. Uh, be warned as you turn that off for camera, microphone, autoplay, virtual reality. So I'm going to do that for virtual reality because that's a new one. So I pop that open permission, block new requests, because I really don't want anybody asking me for permission to do that. Um, be warned that as you do this, you're going to you're going to make things not work like Google Hangouts will not work inside a, a, a Firefox browser if you enable these things that way. So be aware. I'm blocking pop up windows by default. Uh, I do want to be warned when websites are trying to install add ons and I want to prevent accessibility services from accessing my browser. Now, if you're if you're somebody that uses a Firefox browser um, and you have you, uh, you know, you're blind, you're deaf, and you need to use an accessibility service of some kind, um, be, be aware that that is a third party so piece of software that you might be adding to the browser. So uh, you'll have to come in here and uncheck that to be able to allow. I'm going to cancel that for right now. Um, but, uh, but just be aware. Uh, Firefox data collection and use. These are all, uh, these are all informations that go back to Mozilla and Firefox. It's technical interaction data based on your browsing habits. I always uncheck that stuff. I'm just not comfortable sharing any of my browsing habits with anybody, even the makers of the platform. Uh, even, in, and, and especially now that there's a separate option to allow Firefox to install and run studies. No, thank you. I really appreciate Firefox telling me that they do that, uh, but I don't necessarily want to participate. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, security and certificates. Uh, under security, deceptive content and dangerous software protection. You want to make sure all of these guys are checked. You want to block dangerous and deceptive content, block dangerous downloads, and warn you about unwanted and uncommon software. Uh, also for certificates, I want to be asked every time when a server requests a personal certificate. A server sometimes will say, I would like a certificate for you to verify your browser identity. Um, if you're using HTTPS uh, connections that usually, and encryption, it usually never happens. Um, but, uh, but I will, and, and one way to look for that is by at being asked every time. So um, that's it for privacy and security. The last five things that you need to do to make your Firefox browser super secure is by adding extensions. And there's five specific ones that I'm going to recommend. Uh, and I'm going to go up here to add-ons. And here they are. Cookie auto delete, HTTPS everywhere, no script the EFF Privacy Badger, and uBlock Origin. These five recommended extensions for your Firefox, and I think most of them are available on Google Chrome as well, uh, will help you be even more secure. Cookie Auto Delete, uh, and I'll show you how each one of these works as we go and visit a test site. So let's say we're gonna go to cnn.com. 
If I go to CNN, uh, it's going to serve me up really nice looking website with all kinds of fun stuff. But as you notice, whoa, all of my extensions are going insane up here. I just browsed the CNN.com. I didn't go anywhere else. And uBlock Origin, which is an ad blocker, recorded 63 requests for information from CNN.com. Um, that's a lot. And as I hit the requests block button, it shows me from every one of the trackers that are being used to pull information from my browsing session. I recognize some of these because they're coming from the CNN.com domain, but some of them, I don't know what ad in excess is. I don't know what ad safe protected is. I don't know what, I don't know what a lot of this stuff is. And it's, it's kind of scary when I think about how many trackers we're automatically requesting information about my discoverable fingerprint on my browser. Um, these requests are all blocked because I had uBlock Origin running. Now, sometimes a website will will not allow you to see anything on the website if you uh, you know if you have that running. It's up to you to make to make the decision about whether or not you want to turn it off. Now, I also use the HTTPS Everywhere extension. This forces an HTTPS connection for every website that offers it. If you're going to a site that is that that doesn't have the S on the HTTP, that means that the connection between you and the website server is unencrypted, which means anybody can look into activity that you might be engaging on on that server. Um, this particular extension forces an HTTPS connection if it's available from the server that you're visiting. If it's not, that should tell you something about the server that you're visiting. It should tell you that that server is actually probably trying to pull some information from your uh, from its users user session. So beware. Cookie auto auto delete. This is really nice because it will actually detect all of the cookies that have been immediately downloaded to the site. Again, we just went to CNN.com uh, and 14 cookies were automatically downloaded to the browser. Uh, cookie auto delete. I can hit clean and pull them out. I can also get the option for just the cookies on this domain. Went from 14 to zero. Uh, if I leave CNN parked here for right now, uh, there will be more cookies because part of the way cookies work is that um, uh, they're they're counting on the fact that you don't log out of your out of out of your uh, uh, your CNN account or you don't leave the website. Um, so so cookie auto delete will see. There we go. We got two of them that just popped up automatically, um, and we didn't do anything. Uh, the last extension that I'll tell you about um, is NoScript. So NoScript actually detects and blocks all of the JavaScript requests on a page. Now JavaScript can be used for very, very non-nefarious reasons, like serving up a, a high definition photo uh, on a website. Um, unfortunately, it's really difficult to determine which scripts are dangerous and which scripts are not. So the NoScript app gives you control over all of the places that are serving up scripts. And as you can see, all of those ad trackers that uBlock Origin checked out, it, they have some type of JavaScript request that is being added to the page. So when I look at this, I can say, wow, I'm not comfortable with any of this. You, JavaScript or NoScript gives you the option up here to revoke temporary permissions. And if I do that, for every script that's on the page, whoop, I broke CNN.com. So this is the this is the trade-off that you have to you have to kind of see for yourself and understand. Well, I wanted to look at this website, but I'm not comfortable with all of the scripts running. I turned off all the scripts. Well, now I can't actually see the website. Um, so you got to go back through and actually decide which ones are important. Um, you can give a temporary permission to the trusted scripts uh, by clicking one of these, comes back, and then you can literally go script by script and say, I don't trust this one. I like this one. I like them not. Uh, any of these domains and scripts that are over here, uh, you can actually do a click and no script will show you a little bit of discoverable information about each one of those ad trackers and scripts. Um, so this is, this is helpful for understanding how people are farming information about your browsing habits um, on, uh, uh, on the internet. Uh, it's a lot of information, I know, uh, and it's probably something that we're not thinking about as we're going from website to website as we're investigating things. Uh, but it's something to be to be aware of. And these five uh, extensions, along with the EFF Privacy Badger, uh, which I'll show you again on CNN, uh, the Privacy Badger. This is really just a great additional way of discovering some information about additional trackers. So if you use these five, 
um, you've got a hardened Firefox browser along with all the other security options that I just mentioned. So um, that's it for Firefox. I want to pause real quick before I talk about a couple of the other browsers and, and move on to see if there's any questions or thoughts. So um, we, I know in terms of time, we've got about 15 minutes left. So I know we've got a lot to get through. There's, the first question is, um, and I similarly use Chrome, partly because we are a kind of a Google outfit. So we, we use G Suite. Um, but from seeing your presentation, it makes me think we should all be on Firefox. So it, it's really much better than Chrome, I'm assuming, because Chrome is eating up all of our data in a way that Firefox isn't. I mean, that's the trade-off, right? So if I'm, if I'm I, I, Chrome, Chrome is a great browser. Uh, and a lot of these, in fact, all five of these extensions, the Privacy Badger, NoScript, they're all available from the Chrome store as well. Uh, the difference is, is that Google as a company is doing different stuff with your browsing habits and your data. It's actually linking your browsing habits to your Gmail, to your calendar use, all of the other Google products that it uses. Um, that is the Google enterprise. Some folks are really okay with that. Um, they're fine with the fact that, yeah, we're, we're, you know, I want more contextually relevant ads for, you know, Coke instead of Pepsi or whatever it happens to be. Um, but it, 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 it's a trade-off. There's, there are privacy risks there. Uh, Google is, is super secure with all of the data that it collects on its users. Uh, it tries, it, there, there have been very, very few uh, known successful hacks as far as I know with your personal information. Um, but that being said, I can use a Google keyword ad planner to determine people from a particular area, search for and use certain habits and use that information for a disinformation campaign. Um, and I've done nothing, nothing wrong other than just use the Google Chrome browser. So it's, it's something to think about. Yeah, it's a good point, Thank you, Chris. Um, the last thing I do wanna, I do wanna talk Google Chrome. All of these options are, are available, say for the, the, the WebRTC request in Google Chrome. Uh, real quickly, if you just go and oh, if you're a Chrome user, you just pop over here, you hit your three dots, you've got, a settings menu, everything that we just did in Firefox, you can do the same thing in Chrome. Uh, and again, make them make your settings as restrictive as possible to maximize the security. The last little thing on browsers that I'll show you is this browser called Brave. Uh, if you haven't heard of Brave before, uh, Brave is really interesting because it's built on a Chromium build. So it's similar to a Google Chrome browser, but it's got even more automated protections into it. All of the extensions and everything that I just talked about are are kind of built into a single, uh, a single user interface and protection protocol. So when I go on Brave to CNN.com, everything that I talked about is contained in a single protection shield up here. So for folks that, are, that, are, that want some level of, of, of security and are just, you know, hey, I don't have time to be, you know, to be dorking around with all of these settings and everything, out of the box, Brave works pretty well. Um, so this is a, this is a really good privacy focused, uh, browser that you might want to use, um, as a recommendation. And again, you've got some, you've got some options for turning your shields up or up or down to block things. And it's just a, it's just a one and done kind of thing. Uh, so that is, da, 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 that is our browser hardening stuff. I got a couple of additional things that I want to show you on browser hardening before we get into some best practices to wrap stuff up. Um, so the last thing I want to tell you in terms of browsers, is there are nuclear options. There are even more protected uh, ways to go about uh, securing yourself. And those are virtual machines and managed attribution browsers. Virtual machines are essentially machines that run on other servers or other computers that you tunnel into from your local machine. They're super, uh, super secure because anytime that you do something wrong, you click on something, you're only infecting the virtual machine and not your local machine. Uh, managed attribution browsers are essentially browser applications that run in pre-configured virtual machines. Uh, so it's, you open the browser, you do browsing, but all of it's still happening on a virtual machine someplace. Uh, they're usually very expensive options, uh, but they're ultra secure. And, and really, really good for investigating risky parts of the internet. Uh, so let's, uh, let's transition over into best, uh, best practices, so our, our third goal. Uh, and I wanna stay with the browser stuff right now to talk about some of our best practices. Uh, this one's gonna make all you journalists really, really hurt a little bit. Don't keep a million browser tabs open at one time. It is a terrible practice. I do it too. I'm very, very guilty of this. 
uh, the more tabs that you have open, the more cookies are being downloaded to your session, the more that they're interacting together and sharing information about who you are and where you are. Uh, instead, close tabs that you're not using, bookmark regularly visited sites, come back to them when you need to, and use multiple browsers for different categories of browsing. Don't allow your browser to remember credit card information. Use Blur. I'll tell you about what Blur here in just a minute at the end of the presentation. Don't allow your browser to remember passwords. We've already talked about this. Use a trusted, reputable password manager that auto creates and encrypts passwords. Allow, don't allow tracking or third-party cookies. We just went through some ways of uh, fixing that and using those extensions right there will, will further enable uh, trackers from not, not tracking you. Don't browse to non-secure URLs and, and we use the HTTP, HTTPS Everywhere extension to force secure encrypted connections on, on uh, Chrome and Firefox. Don't enter personal information anywhere unless absolutely necessary and under the most secure circumstances. Use dummy email addresses, burner accounts, and passwords different from your primary identity. Part of the exercise of understanding your digital footprint is understanding do I really need to let information about me out to places that I don't know what they're going to do with it? Nine times out of 10, whenever you're using your credit card and it's asking for a billing address, it's not doing anything with the billing address other than figuring out a way to send you a catalog. So you don't necessarily need to use your billing address to use your credit card. And in fact, you don't need to use your credit card anymore because there's a service for that that'll help you obfuscate it. Whatever you do, don't browse unsecurely from a public Wi-Fi source. So if you go to a Starbucks uh, or anywhere else, use a VPN at a minimum. Uh, assume that there is someone sitting on that Wi-Fi uh, somehow looking at activity. By, what do I mean by looking at activity? Literally understanding who's connected, uh, what services they're logged into, what IP addresses you've been to, and establishing a pattern of life. Uh, super unsecure. All right. Whoop. Okay. Let's talk best practices for VPN selection. I've been talking about VPNs. You're probably like, which one do you use? Um, I'm a big fan of Proton VPN, um, but there's a lot of other ones that are out there. Choose a VPN service that is independently reviewed and well rated by a third party security expert like Wirecutter. Wirecutter is a New York Times company that does product reviews in the tech space. Uh, use a VPN of choice that does not log user sessions. A quick story about a, a VPN provider called Hide My Ass. Uh, it was a free provider at one point. You go in, you use it through the browser, and presumably it, it, uh, it didn't log any sessions. Well, the FBI came knocking at, uh, on Hide My Ass at one point and said, hey, we think there's some pretty bad people that are using your service, so we would like to see all your user sessions. And, and what do you know? They did record the user sessions. So uh, uh, make sure that you get that independent review of the VPN that, that determines whether or not the company that provides the VPN logs those user sessions. Use a VPN with many egress point options. By egress points, we mean where you can look like you're coming out of. So I'm coming out of New York today, but uh, one of the other reasons I like Proton VPN is they offer over 160 different egress points for servers across the world uh, in places like, uh, like Africa, South America, you name it. Now, the performance of those egress points will vary from, from uh, company to company just based on, on uh, how fast the servers are and how many people are using them at any one point. Uh, but the more options that you have to look like you're coming out of someplace else is great. Use a VPN with auto connect functionality so that it's always on even when your browsing is interrupted. So if you're like me and you've got to go do something really quick and you just shut your laptop instead of actually shutting everything down first, uh, a good VPN like Proton VPN will, will uh, remember that you were connected to the internet. And as you open the computer up again, before the browser can start connecting to things again, the VPN will actually make sure that it is connected first and that you're protected before it allows any traffic inside the browsers that you accidentally left open. Finally, check your IP address manually to ensure that your VPN is working every time before you begin browsing. So use that IP leak website uh, to do that. Um, Okay, uh, change, uh, these are some just regular best practices for general digital security. Change the username and password in your home and office Wi-Fi router. Don't use the admins. If you're a Fios user for, Vi uh, for Verizon, I think the, the, the routers usually begin with an AQ designation uh, for, the, for the names and then there's a specific password combination. Uh, change that as soon as you get turned on. If you've never changed it before, change it right now. Uh, as soon as you get off this, um, uh, you know, call your provider, go to their help desk and figure out how to do it. 
delete programs and apps from your devices that you don't use regularly. You never know when that old words of uh, words with friends app on your phone uh, has been sold to somebody and suddenly because it's on your phone, the SDK, the software development kit has a new cookie that downloads to your phone and tracks your location. Uh, if you don't play it anymore, get rid of it. If you keep uh, any, any programs that you have on your devices, make sure that you keep them regularly updated. So have auto update on all the time. Use two-factor authentication on every service that offers it. Uh, use a reputable, well-reviewed antivirus program on your desktop or your laptop. If you're a PC user, Windows Defender is pretty awesome. Uh, so it's out of the box. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, if you're an other than PC user, you want something else for your PC, I hear Malwarebytes is pretty great. Uh, and then make sure that you're not just using the, the, the free version, that you're actually buying the premium version. And do perform regular privacy and security audits and checkups on Google, Apple, and all of the other services that you use. Work with your IT guy, not against them. Um, if you work for a company that has resources, uh, dedicated IT security managers, they probably already have policies involved. Um, get to know what those policies are um, uh, so, that, so that they conform in some way with your personal risk tolerance for how you want to use your company's devices, um, uh, accounts that they provide, and those types of things. Um, the last thing, so this is all going to be available to you. Uh, uh, if when you get a, uh, You'll get a link for participating in, in the, uh, the webinar today. All of these will be available to you. This is just a summary of all the resources that we talked about today, the extensions that we talked about. Uh, I do quickly want to talk about some of my sources that, uh, uh, that I get all this information from. I mentioned uh, Brian Krebs, Wire Cutter, and Privacy Tools. Uh, Swift, Silent, and Deadly, this is the guy that I learned digital security from. He's probably one of the best digital security trainers and literally wrote, wrote a book about it. Uh, go visit his blog and the tag for digital security if you really, really want to uh, become an advanced user in, uh, in protecting yourself online. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, that, uh, that takes us through everything. Uh, Claire, I'll hand it back over to you. Um, thanks, Chris. I, there wasn't any questions, but I think that's just because there was a lot of information there, which was really, really valuable. And I think in many ways, the focus on browsers was not necessarily what I expected you were going to focus on. But as you went through everything, I was reminded that it's really core to everything that we do. And the stuff that I'm just like, oh, does it really matter? It really does. I mean, I think the CNN moment was the moment that probably all of us had our jaws dropped and you know I, I have privacy badger and then after a while I was like Ugh, whenever it's a bit annoying but then actually anyway so for me it's been really helpful um I've got a question which is a question that um is one of those dumb questions but I have a mac and I like to think to myself that because I have a mac I don't have to worry as much about viruses and malware are you going to tell me that that is a wrong assumption so uh, that is a wrong assumption. Uh, I would say that Mac and Apple are generally kind of good. Uh, they're, if not better, one of the things that you're paying for with all that extra money is, is the fact that the walled garden is, is super secure, uh, so long as you're keeping your devices regularly updated um, and that you're trading in obsolete devices for new ones. Um, that being said, though, it's not 100%. Um, uh, there is malware that's out there. There's more than ever that's been specifically written for uh, for, for Macs and iOS devices. Uh, so you got, you got to still be careful. Um, I, I run a malware bytes program on my, on my Mac, uh, as, as sort of like a second, uh, second layer of, of, of protection. But I, depending on the security expert that you talk to, some folks will be like, Hey, I'm fine. As long as I keep my, my, my MacBook updated and, and I engage in really good browsing habits, I don't need it. Um, yeah. but if you're one of those folks that spends a lot of time on the dark web, uh, yeah. that spends a lot of time going to sketchy sites, um, maybe you want to kind of up your game a little bit on, on a Mac. Yeah, you know, that's, that's really great advice. And, and somebody's actually asked the question, um, presumably all bookmarks should be encrypted too. Presumably. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, we, would, we would think that and we would believe that. But again, remember all the ways that you can surrender information about, about your browsing habits, bookmarks is one of them. Um, we think that they're encrypted because the browsers say that they are, but it's the same, it's the same risk that you have with, with having a browser remember your password or your credit card information. Um, so I would just be careful about using bookmarks in any meaningful way. Um, uh, I, I don't use them myself, and that's, that's super lame. 
but I, but I also, I kind of use it for a mental health reason. Like I don't need a thousand bookmarks for places that, oh, hey, I want to go see what the Avengers are doing today, right? Just because I see it in my bookmark list. But um, uh, I, I think it depends. I think it depends, unfortunately. Great. Um, I've also got a question about VPNs. I mean, our team obviously spend all day monitoring misinformation. So they kind of have VPNs on as a default. But as somebody who, like, where do you think there's the level where you're like, yes, you, you know, the minute you turn your computer on, you should have a VPN versus only if you're doing certain types of investigations? All day, every day. Um, a, the, the, one of the things that, that Justin from the Swift, Silent, and Deadly blog recommends is, is doing a threat modeling exercise. And one of those exercises asks you to ask yourself, what data are you trying to protect and when? Um, so if you're worried because you're at home and you're like, Hey, you know, there's a VPN already running on my home router or something like that. Um, that may be a reason not to use a VPN. It, again, it kind of comes back to how, how secure am I? How, how much do I feel? And, and, and I go back to where we began this conversation, which is, I don't always know how the internet is changing. I don't always know that, that the websites that I'm visiting are not going to be sold to some firm, you know, a year down the line and the yeah, user log about that. So, yeah. so I, because I don't know that, I'm always using a VPN. I mean, it yeah. doesn't matter where I am or what service that I'm on, I'm, I'm always using it. Yeah, and somebody actually asked a great question, which is, what would you define as the dark web exactly? And why should journalists be concerned about people in the dark web tracking our activity while we cover coronavirus? Like, can you uh, kind of give us the big why? Yeah, that's a great question. So what is the dark web? Um, think about the dark web and, and to understand the dark web, I'm also gonna use the terminology of the deep web as well. Those two things are different. Uh, the deep web is really anything that is not indexed by a search engine. Um, so you can go and search uh, Google Bank of America, uh, and you can find Bank of America's website on the clear web, uh, but you can't actually get individual's information from bankofamerica.com. That is technically the deep web because it is protected by Bank of America, the company, all of your online banking stuff. So that's deep web information. Now, the dark web, however, is a different part of the internet that is defined by special connection technologies. Uh, the one that we are most familiar with on the dark web is uh, a series of websites called dot onions. Uh, and onion websites are, are that if you look up in the URLs, they're a combination of mishmash letters and numbers, and then usually ends in a dot onion. You can only visit those websites on the Tor network using the Tor browser. Uh, there are plenty of other darknet architectures that are out there. There's I2P, there's uh, the Freenet project, uh, there's a bunch of them, but they are special technologies that ride on top of the backbone of the regular internet. So if you are investigating something on the dark web, uh, you, are, you, you automatically need to be thinking about a different security protocol uh, for how you're approaching that, right? So let's say, um, let's say you know, someone's selling some information about, uh, you know, about people that are investigating COVID-19 right now. And it's on a, a forum that sits on, uh, on, a, on a Dot Onion site someplace. Um, to, to access it, you need to be using the, top, the Tor browser, which we didn't cover today, uh, but it is a, it is a separate browser uh, that you can browse the ClearNet with, but it also enables you to go to dark websites, certain dark websites. Um, you have to think about all the security options for, for, for visiting that, that website at that time. Um, I'm going to a Dot Onion site, so what can that site see about me? I don't know. Well, to be safe about that, I'm going to close everything else down on the computer that I'm using. In some cases, I may just want a different computer. Uh, if I'm going to forums like Freenet or, uh, or I2P, which are separate darknet architectures, I don't want any of that technically conflated with any of the stuff that I'm using on my, my regular personal machine or work machine. Um, I, would, I would go and get a dirty machine um, to, to access those, those particular those particular places. So there, there's a lot to consider about accessing dark websites, um, depending on the network that you're going to, what, whatever dark network happens to be. Uh, we do have one more question. What are the tool um, that we use to differ us from using our actual credit cards? You mentioned a tool and said uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about it later. Awesome. Let me, let me hit the credit card one uh, yeah. right on the nose because I did say that we were gonna talk about that. That's from the same company that does the delete me service. So a bean uh, offers a service called blur uh, that anonymizes your credit card. So it does cost a little bit. Uh, you sign up for it, you give them your credit card information. And then every time that you go to 
a website where you're trying to pay for something, there's a blur extension that sits on your browser that you can then use uh, that will enter automatically enter an obfuscated credit card number uh, and act as the firewall between whatever site that you're buying something from and your credit card. Uh, so you're never surrendering information about your credit card. You're never surrendering information that's connected to your credit card, like uh, like billing addresses or shipping addresses. Um, super secure, very very awesome. Um, but it's also uh, it's also offered as part of a package with Delete Me. Uh, Delete Me being the service that goes through and kind of opts out of everything and cleans up your digital footprint. So uh, I highly recommend. I use both of these things uh, quite often, and they're they're very very helpful. Great. Thanks, Chris. And it's good to end this with a sense of like, oh, I can do this. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah. If, so if, if anybody takes away any like, like this, all this takes is a little bit of time. And, and it, one of the things that I had to learn myself in doing this is, hey, if I just stopped looking at pictures of laughing cats all day, and just, you know, sat down and got really serious about doing this, I would build better habits so that I can return to looking at laughing cats, just in a more secure way. <laughs> And the unfortunate truth is that many of us do have um, extra hours that we're looking at our computers. Maybe all those boring Zoom calls that we're on. Not this one. This one was excellent. So thank you very much, Chris, for your time. And thank you, everybody, for joining our um, Reporting on Coronavirus webinar. Um, this is part of a series. We have many uh, that you can now access on our YouTube channel. Um, my name is Claire Wardland, the US Director of First Draft. Thank you very much to Chris Dufour, who we might bring back to do another one, maybe on the ad more advanced subjects. Um, but if you um, want additional resources there on our website, please follow us on Twitter. Um, thank you for watching and we will be back as we are most days talking about different elements of reporting on coronavirus. Thank you very much.